This morning's session is just such a pleasure to be able to introduce um, and to be able to introduce our wonderful speakers. I want to talk briefly about why lifestyle emissions and behaviour change matter so very much when we're talking about climate change this week here at Climate Week. Because actually, shouldn't we be talking about electricity systems and fossil fuels and agriculture and all of these big macro systems that need to be changed? The one thing to remember, though, is that those big macro systems only exist because of people and because of what we ask for, what we demand, how we work, how we eat, how we travel, what we, what, what we desire. All those big, big, big systems that we're trying to change um, are there to serve us. There's seven and a half billion of us. Now, some of those systems serve us more than others. Some of us get to consume a great deal more of those products and services than other people do. But when it comes down to it, everything about climate change is actually about people. And so what we're going to be talking about this morning is about those people. It's about how we change, whether we can change, what cha how change works, um, and particularly the role of business in making change. And I'm so excited because after 20 years, actually no, 20 years, 25 years, I forget how old I am. After 25 <laughs> years of working in sustainability um, and being passionate um, about the role of behaviour change, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has finally acknowledged this just this year how central behaviour change and socio-cultural change is to our climate fight. In fact, this is a direct quote from AR6 um, at Working Group 3. With policy support, socio-cultural options and behavioural change can reduce global GHG emissions of NG sectors by at least 5% rapidly and more until 2050. Now, 5% of demand-side carbon, which arguably is up to 70% of carbon, is huge. That is a world-changing amount of carbon. Um, and it can be saved rapidly. Now, the, the, that might not sound like such an exciting word, but in IPCC speak, rapidly is really quickly. Much quickly, much, much faster perhaps, than technology can de be deployed or infrastructure can be changed. Because that all takes a great bit, deal of time, whereas actually each of us can change what we do tomorrow. So, uh, in 2004, <laughs> So going back a while, Futella wrote the first behaviour change strategy for the UK government on climate change. Um, and since then, in, in, in the, in the, the, over the decades since then, uh, we've been ab absolutely dedicated to seeing about the ways in which change can happen. And one of the things to be careful of in this conversation that we've learned, which the IPCC reflects, is that sociocultural change and lifestyle changes can accept, accelerate climate change um, mitigation, but only when it's with a parallel pursuit of, uh, of uh, technology deployment, deployment and policy. So we, we can't just do it on our own. We can't ask people to be the only things that change in this. We need the policy change, we need the technology change, and we need the behaviour change to all happen at once. Now, sometimes people set this up as an either-or. We either need to focus on behaviour change or policy change. And some people say, no, this is all about powerful people. And some people say, no, this is all about people power. Whereas, of course, as the IPCC acknowledges, it must always be both. We, as individuals, have the massive power to make a difference but only if the structures and the policies and the technology around us enable us to do so. And some of us have more ability to make change than others. The IPCC makes extremely clear that the vast responsibility for this change is on the 10% of us who consume the most. Those of us who are living in a, a socioeconomic status that disproportionately affects emissions. Now, um, when we think about, perhaps standing here in the US, when we think about billionaires, perhaps we're thinking that those are the 10%. If you're living in the US um, and you have a roof over your head and you have a car, if you're living in, in Europe and you can go to a supermarket, you are part of that 10%. I think sometimes many of us forget that the incredible low impact of most people around the world. So, for example, I live in the UK. Um, even an average middle-class lifestyle in the UK is 10 times higher in, uh, per capita 
of its carbon footprint than someone living a middle class life in, in China, for example. So everybody who's here, and pretty much everybody who's watching, it's us. We have this power. Now, that can feel like an, a, a pretty significant responsibility, or it can feel like an awesome opportunity, because many of us feel powerless in the face of climate change. But the IPCC has just told us that we're not. We actually have this incredible, awesome ability to make change. In fact, the IPCC even tells us those changes that need to be made. They set out 61 behavioral outcomes, and my colleagues at BE Works will explain later about the fact that these are outcomes, not behaviors. Mm. These 61 changes that if made at scale by that 10% would have a fundamental impact on our ability to keep within 1.5. And there's a great deal of science behind these behaviors. And the sacrifice message, the idea that somehow by making these changes, we're doing a great thing for the planet at our own disadvantage, is quite simply crap. And it really, really annoys me how that message continues to be part of our narrative about living a sustainable lifestyle. That it's hair shirts and, you know, tofu, and although I actually love tofu. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just like, go, actually, I quite like sandals and tofu. Yes. Um, but then it's, it's, some, it's somehow this lesser life that you're going to have a lower standard of living, that you're going to not be able to have what you desire and enjoy. Um, whereas actually, the science would show us that the exact opposite is true. And that I'm not, I'm beginning to think that perhaps that message about a sustainable lifestyle being a less mm. of a life is even malicious, that it's out there deliberately to try to hold us back from the changes we need to make. Because this uh, analysis, which was done by the IPCC, looking at the major changes to, to demand side that we need to make, and then doing a very detailed cross with the social SDGs. So the social SDGs on mobility, on shelter, on energy, on health, on security and economic development. And the deeper the blue, the more positive the correlation between climate action and fulfilling that SDG. And there is a lot of blue on this slide. So this shows us that the things which we need to do in our lifestyles for climate change, we should want to do because it's going to make us happier, healthier, make us more secure and safe, be able to increase economic stability within our societies, give us more time. These are massive proven advantages to making these behavior changes in our lives. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to just close there, and I'm gonna hand over to Per epstein Stockness, who is both an economist and a behavioral scientist, to talk a little bit about if we're gonna do this, how are we gonna do it? Per, thank you. Terrific. And what a wonderful introduction. So let me just jump straight into it. Um, studies show that uh, the top 1% typically have 49% of the emissions and the top 10% incomes much more than half, right? So the gut reaction then of most scientists or maybe environmentalists, particularly in the rational Western sphere, is to put, get the finger out and feel moral outrage. We get into a blame game. So get the rich, tax the rich, stop you evil guys. And that includes me, of course. I'm a white male over 55 in wealthy Norway. Now, so that's correct, but is it useful? Does it help? And uh, I guess you assume what I think about the answer. Unfortunately, it is an ineffectual theory of change. Behavioral change comes from somewhere else. And first, we have to understand then the barriers of why it doesn't work. Now, this is, um, I have way too few minutes, so there's a longer version of my TED talk on this issue. But in case um, you haven't seen it, I will summarize the five main reasons why this doesn't work. Point one, the human brain, particularly in those who have hearing about this for some time, is that climate news is distant, oops, is distant in time, space, and responsibility. So it doesn't really feel near and urgent. There are, you know, this is, a, I summarized about 300 studies on this issue. Just Google 
psychological distancing if you want to see how powerful this is. Second, we've been hearing about how bad climate change is, how bad it's going to get, and that you're responsible so many times that each time you get it, the response becomes a little bit lower. We are suffering apocalypse fatigue. So what the brain does is 1.1, it habituates. Secondly, it starts to avoid the messenger. So if you give me a blame, I'll, I'll stop listening to you. And third, I will project stereotypes back at you. You are just a goddamn tree hugger, as they say over here. <laughs> third, dissonance. So yes, I know what I should do, but I need a car to get to that party. I need to drive my kid. I need to fly and so on. So we have this conflict between what we know and what we do and the brain comes up with self-justifications. So I find ways to feel good about it. Cognitive dissonance is one of the most well-researched psychological mechanisms we have in psychology. It's like a bit like gravity in physics. <laughs> Fourth, if you keep having dissonance and avoid doom, the brain learns not to notice. And it's automatic, so it goes down in the cellar. You now live as if you do not know what you do know. So you may be on climate week and get all fired up, but by Tuesday morning next week, you live as if it never happened. That's a social contract that subconsciously pushes it down. Fifth identity, lifestyles, values. If somebody asks me or tells me my lifestyle is bad, it's no longer about climate science or rationality or facts. It's about me. And I get pissed because you're attacking me and I want to attack you back. That's why the climate debate goes really bad often. And of course, this is the polarization that is ripping America apart. So what to do about it and um, what actually works according to social science? Well, there's a pretty good consensus on that as well. Though different studies show different effects depending on the exact cultural context and situations and sectors, etc. So we need to keep working on it, but the principles are clear. I'm very glad you're going through many of these today. We have to make it social. So hello, we don't have time. Social networks really works. We have to shift the social norms so that it is normal to have a climate-friendly lifestyle. And you're weird if you run around in this kind of big polluting SUV when you could do an electric bike. Why on earth would you want to sit in a suburban? That's the new social norms, the new normal. And then, of course, we need to get out of the doom barrier by giving po people a balanced approach. Positivity ratio is three opportunities to each threat. Sometimes I get criticized. Dockness, you're just a climate psychologist telling people to think positively. <sighs> I get so <laughs> tired. <laughs> I've been saying it for 15 years. We should be that very clear it's an existential threat. And it's just an amazing stuff of things we can do about it. Mm -hmm. So if you leave people with the first and not those three opportunities, then they start to tune out and all the other barriers get back. Dissonance, I think Google will be speaking about nudging, how to make things simple. Hopefully others will as well. It has to be a default. So if, you, if you're not attentive and you're not paying a lot of attention and not using your slow, rational mind. You just go there and pick something in the store or on the buffet, then you end up with the most climate-friendly options. Or if you just Google something and you find the most climate-friendly option on top, that's very helpful. Fourth, we need new stories and new signals. And I'll, I think I'm running over time now. I forgot to have my clock. There's no clock here. Okay. So, one key way to make behavior sustained is to give people feedback that they're doing something right. It's called the growth mindset. You need to have a little bit of support and acknowledgement that if you do these tiny steps, wow, that's cool, Per Espen. You're doing well now. Am I? Really? Yeah. Okay, let me do, let's try again. Oh, it went well again. Yes. This is how the human brain works. Doing those long-term, by New Year's Eve, 1st of January next year, I will never fly again. Doesn't really work but maybe five, six percent, seven percent better every year or every month or whatever you want to do. That helps. Then we need feedback from either apps or people, preferable people, peers, uh, support and trust, and finally we need to change the story. 
because if I feel that the world is going to hell anyway, I won't care. But if I feel I'm part of a larger movement, a, a, a community of people now feeling deep meaning and purpose in the sense of becoming aligned with nature again, aligned with the air, this beautiful sky that's breathing us. Wow, I want to be part of that. That really helps we get out of those polarized values and, and positions. So are individual solutions enough? That's another criticism I often get. Psychologists are only on individual behavior. It doesn't really help. We need structural change. We need policy change. And of course, as a politician, I've been in parliament. I know that I'm not there to solve problems. I'm there to be re-elected. And mm -hmm. I know what to do, but I don't know how to do it and get re-elected. So, what we do need is individual behavior change that supports structural change, and the structural change supports individual change. That's a self-reinforcing cycle. That's what's lacking. We need to get that going. There is no systems, sustained system of structural change without individual change. And there is no in, um, individual change that is sustained unless the structures support it, and individual change needs to support the structural change, and the politicians get re-elected. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for sort of about one question for Pear, if we may. Um, who's got a question about how we make change? I have one at the back. I've got one up to you. And because I forgot to bring my mic, I'm going to come and stand really close to you so when you talk, that, 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 it, that the mic here will pick you up. There thank you go. You, thank you. Um, hi, my name's Shell. I work for Business for Nature, which is a, a global advocacy organization. So I was wondering, I really love the the kind of mindset shift that you're talking about, you know, like how to uh, change to a more positive mindset, not only focus on the problem, but also the solution. But I wonder, what do you think about the, the news cycle that we're in? You know, like the headlines, they're so focused, so obsessed with negative news, um, you know, like disasters every day. So how do we break out of this cycle? Because the news is what people consume every day. So, you know, how, how do we really be solution focused and be, be positive and really be inspiring? Um, in, in this mass media that we're consuming? Mm. So incredibly important uh, question. Uh, so the media is addicted to the apocalypse story, the narrative, uh -huh. doom, it because is. that makes it possible to put it on the front page and use huge fonts, and, and people can nod and feel very uh, concerned. And, and that's uh, a way mm. to sell magazines. Uh, you trigger a little bit of fear. But, but what I try to tell with the doom barrier is that gradually you um, do over exploit people's mm -hmm. capacity for empathy and you over exploit people's capacity to deal with fear. So we need to change journalism. And happily, I'm not a journalist, but there are people working on this. I could recommend climate communications here in the US, Susan Hassol. She has training programs for journalists on how to write about this in a much better way. And she has a lot of success. So she's also I've been advising some IPCC communications with more or less, I would say, success. <laughs> it's difficult to change the, the enlightenment mindset that we're rational, and if we have a clear threat, we will respond rationally. Uh, but we need to keep working on that. And the good news is that if we tell personalized stories about people who do change, then people can resonate with that. The problem is that the top people on the desk of the newspapers and the media, they prefer those big catastrophic headlines to the ones that show positive change because they don't get that number of clicks. But with social media such as We Don't Have Time and Putara and other, we can generate more clicks for those positive change stories where actually things are done and all the incredible thing that's done in business. So I think as big as a threat as greenwashing is, even bigger is green hushing. We don't mm -hmm. speak enough about all the incredible cool things that are happening mm -hmm. around us. If we did more, we would feel a change of social norms that this is the new way emerging now. So we need media and journalists, and particularly the people on the top of the journalist hierarchy, those on the desk, as we call it, they need to understand this dynamic and their role in it. And there's no way around educating them. Thank you, Jupiter, for joining us. And in fact, last night here at Solutions House, we had a panel with journalists from Bloomberg and Time and Grist talking about what makes a good solution story. So um, I'd recommend having a watch of that. Am I going to hand... 
I, I'm actually just going to ask Johan to step up and say a very quick word of welcome because um, I was so excited about Pear, I forgot to introduce Johan. So. Okay, thanks. Disappointed. <laughs> Sorry. Fine. Yes, absolutely. But uh, I'll just say a few words. I think we have a tremendous opportunity. We heard yesterday that we will never be able to cut emissions unless we scale up the climate solutions exponentially. So we need that laser focus on the solutions. And the opportunity, what is that? Well, we talked about the 10%, which is not the people. It is us, us the 10%. And we can actually take the first step. We can't get to one ton, but what a lot of our members, companies and research shows, we can actually halve emissions in less than five years by shifting consumption, not stopping consuming, shifting consumption towards climate solutions and improve our quality of life, which I think is really important because if we can't show that we can improve quality of life, it's very difficult to inspire other people. And that is possible. I, I know it from all these companies. We, we have the data that, um, and I know it from my personal experience. I was pretty ignorant 15 years ago. I managed to halve my emissions two times and improve my quality of life. That I can't go further right now. Need more policy, of course, need more solutions. But I think if we can create that virtuous circle between the 10% who has such a responsibility together with the companies providing the solutions, advertisers who actually provide you know, our view on lifestyles, that is a tremendous opportunity. Thanks. Thank you so much, Johan. You see, this is, um, this is why I need to invite Johan up to give that kind of insight. So um, I, it is with absolute great pleasure that I, I now invite uh, Google's Chief Sustainability Officer um, to tell the story of how Google is engaging with this and uh, if you haven't heard this before, you're going to love it because there's more going on than you might think. So, Kate. <laughs> well, good morning. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all. And Soli and Johan, thank you so much for all of your partnership. What an incredible space you've created here in the Solutions House. Um, thank you for all the amazing convening you're doing here. And I'm so happy we're having this conversation this morning. As, as you're alluding to, Soleil, this is a topic that I think presents so much opportunity. And we've already heard so much from all of you about that. And, and Pear, I'm excited to talk with you afterwards. Thank you for those excellent remarks. Uh, really, I think you set us up so beautifully, grounding us in all of that information. So thank you. And I also just want to thank Soli and Johan again for your partnership, your thought leadership. Um, and Johan, it's been such an honor for us to be a part of the Exponential Roadmap Initiative with you. And congrats on the new playbook Thanks. that you just Thanks launched. So, so um, lots of things to be grateful for this morning. So I wanted to begin uh, in how we think about this at Google. You know, we are a data company. And we like to look at what are the search trends telling us? Like, what are people actually looking for? What are they interested in? And this is something Soli and I have been talking about for some time. And so I wanted to share with you a few things that we've seen um, from Google search trends. We've seen that terms like rooftop solar power, solar energy, and electric bikes have increased in, just through the roof over the last several years, almost exponential growth in how we're seeing people's interest in searching for these topics. And so for us, that, that's been really meaningful. And we've actually seen that increase really significantly during the pandemic, where you might have wondered, people have other concerns, we're living through this global crisis. But in fact, we've seen interest in all of these sustainable lifestyles topics increase dramatically year over year over the last several years. So we took note of that at Google. Um, and, I will, and I will tell you, Pear, I don't like to call it nudging. I actually don't think of what we're doing as nudging. I very much think of it as meeting people where they are. We're seeing this huge demand from people, and so we want to meet them with sustainable choices. And we really like to think about it solely to resonate with what you said as the easier choice, the better choice, in many instances, the more cost-effective choice. And so that's very much how we have been entering into this space. And so a couple of years ago, I, I had the opportunity to partner with our CEO, Sundar, leaders across the company, and Soli, to think about what, what is our third decade of climate action at Google? You know, I often say this has been in our DNA since our founding. We've been working on sustainability for a really long time. 
Uh, but as we were approaching this decade of this decisive decade that we're in, we said we should really articulate a new strategy for how we want to approach this work in the next decade. And we thought about it through three dimensions. Of course, it's about leading at Google. It's about how we put our own house in order, how we lead by example. So we set a net zero by 2030 target. And we, in partnership with Johan, have really looked at especially the deep importance of reducing our emissions by at least half this decade. And then we'll take care of the rest of those residual emissions to reach our net zero target. So that's crucial. That is very hard work. Um, but also, that is only the beginning of where I think we can really have our impact. And so we've also looked at how do we support our partners through our platforms like Google Cloud, where we can enable other businesses to reach their targets. We've done a lot of deep work with cities. We actually want to enable over 500 cities by 2030 to reduce a gigaton of carbon through our tools and solutions. Um, and of course, we want to think about this opportunity we're here to talk about today, which is how do we give people these easy choices that they can make in their daily lives to meet them where they are and to enable them and to empower them. And I so appreciate what you're talking about, Claire, that we need to help show that actually this can be exciting. This can be better. Uh, and so that's really the spirit with which we're approaching this. And so we set a really near-term target that by the end of this year, we want to enable a billion new sustainable actions through our core products. And we're making really good progress. And so I wanted to just spend a minute sharing with you all what that looks like for us, kind of where we are on this journey, um, but also where we're heading, because I also really think we're, we, we've only just begun in this work. But as we've approached this, we've kind of looked at it through three dimensions based on the climate science. Where do we see those there being really large climate levers? And, and Soleil was showing you the work from the IPCC, which I think really reinforces that the major opportunity that we have here. But we've looked at it across the dimensions of travel, of powering our homes, and then of buying stuff or shopping, you know, the choices that we make in terms of what we purchase. So in the space of travel, we know this is a huge lever and a place where people are making choices and they want good information about how they can make a different choice. And so the best example is you may have seen this already if you're a Google Maps user, our tool that we call Eco Routes. So now if you're in the US, in Canada, um, or in 40 countries across the EU just as of a couple of weeks ago, you'll see in Google Maps it will default to the most fuel efficient route as long as it has a similar ETA. So in the background, we've done a lot of really deep work with the National Renewable Energy Lab to figure out how do we do that? How do we make sure that we're sending you on a route that is truly more fuel efficient, less carbon intensive, and shouldn't inconvenience you too much, maybe just by a couple minutes? And in fact, when we launched this in Germany, we had a major news outlet who tested this in real time. So as you all know, live demos are always a little nerve wracking, <laughs> but they yeah. sent two of their reporters out to test the eco routes and they found that they did indeed save a huge amount of fuel and they only arrived a few minutes later. So this is working and you'll see it has a little green leaf so you'll know you're on, you're on the eco route. And also we're able to measure the impact and I, and I think I wanna come to that at the end of this conversation but I think that's really crucial and where we need to move this is how can we actually quantify for people the impact that these decisions are having. And so in this partnership with NREL, we've been able to measure that just since October when we launched this in the US, we've been able to take the equivalent of 100,000 fuel-based cars off the road in terms of emissions reductions. So really powerful, this is a huge opportunity. And then also Google Flights, you, know, you saw one of the major levers is how we choose to travel. And uh, we're now including carbon emissions right there in Google Flights. So it's part of the decision-making information that a user receives. If they're going to buy a flight, you can see the different routes, the different destinations, the seat classes. You can also see the carbon footprint. Then there's powering our homes. Um, one thing that I know from, from you know, being a homeowner, I bought a, a new house a couple of years ago and made a move during the pandemic like so many people, and I wanted to figure out how to put solar on my roof. And we know that that's often a barrier to entry for people, that if you have the opportunity to have a, have a roof, you're wondering, well, is there a good, is this a good roof for solar or not? And so we have built a tool that actually helps people understand that through Google Earth imagery. And so Project Sunroof enables you to type in your zip code and your address, and then you can see based on the orientation and shading of your roof, if you actually have a good roof for solar, and then enables you to connect with a solar installer to take that next step. And then, of course, there's the Nest Learning Thermostat, which has been around since 2011. Uh, and Nest enables people in their homes to use heating and cooling more efficiently. 
And I, some of you may have come across this, but on our Nest website, we have a ticker that shows you in real time how much energy everyone has saved who's using a Nest since 2011. So I just looked at the ticker last night, and we're now at over 100 million kilowatt hours of energy since 2011. So I used one of my favorite tools, the EPA emissions calculator, to give you a great equivalency this morning. <laughs> if that is the equivalent of 20 coal-fired power plants for one year. 20 coal-fired power plants. That's how much people in their homes have saved by just optimizing their heating and cooling by 10 to 20%. And then we've been taking it a step further through a new program we launched last year called Nest Renew, which enables more demand management in the home. And so there, we're actually enabling people to optimize their use depending on um, what's happening on the grid. When is the sun shining? When is the wind blowing? When are there extra demands on the grid, as we're seeing right now in a lot of places where it's hot and we need to do more grid management? That's what Nest Renew is able to do in the background. And again, we're seeing some incredible results. My team just shared this with me. We've been working with the Rocky Mountain Institute. And just in this early pilot that we've done, where 350,000 households have participated, um, we've seen uh, that we've helped prioritize clean energy usage for over uh, 10 million hours collectively. And that's just with this initial preview of this tool. So really powerful opportunities for demand management. And our homes can be a big part of that solution. Uh, then shopping. So we know what we buy is, these are actually very large decisions that have a long carbon footprint. So if you're buying an appliance or you're buying a vehicle, these are major decisions that you're making, both from a cost perspective, but also from the life cycle of that product. And so we've been working to bring in more helpful information for people when they're buying a dishwasher or a washing machine um, and using really trusted eco labels like Energy Star, for example, in the US that's run by the Environmental Protection Agency. And this is a really big opportunity as we look at the Inflation Reduction Act. We now have almost 400 billion of tax incentives, many of which are gonna be focused on giving people the opportunity to buy more energy efficient and cleaner products. And so we really wanna utilize Google search as a place where as people are shopping, they can see what are these new rebates that are gonna be available to us. So for example, in the Inflation Reduction Act, there's the high efficiency electric home rebate which is allocating about 4.5 billion in direct rebates. So how do we help people take advantage of that? How do we show them in the shopping flow where there's a rebate, where there's a product that is more energy efficient that they can buy? So we see a really big opportunity there. And same thing goes for electric vehicles. Um, we're, we announced last year and soon this feature is gonna be launching where we'll be showing a lot more detailed information in Google search about the comparison between an electric vehicle uh, and, and an ICE vehicle. So looking at the estimated annual fuel costs, showing you all the different rebates that will now be available via the IRA in the US. So again, just an opportunity from our perspective to give people helpful information when they're at the point of decision and then enabling them to make a more sustainable choice. But I really will tell you, I think this is absolutely just the beginning of the work that we want to do in this space. And I really appreciated Per and Johan, you both were talking about storytelling. That's such an important piece of this. So I'm really excited about the opportunity that we have through YouTube. We have an incredible storytelling platform. And in fact, on Friday, Soleil and I are gonna go spend the day with 50 major YouTube creators, uh, people that, you know, who walk down the street and people know who they are, <laughs> <laughs> um, to talk to them about how do we tell stories about climate in ways that are authentic, um, and I think there's such a huge opportunity that we have there. And I know I've heard of, of other colleagues, um, like my colleague Emma Stewart at Netflix. I was in a session with her yesterday. She's having the same conversation inside Netflix. So that storytelling opportunity is huge. I see a hand, yeah. Hi. Hi. David Wilcox from Reach Scale. Um, wonderful stuff. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Um, could I suggest one place where we're missing the spotlight? Yeah. Great right, spotlight descriptions. I've been to a dozen conferences here. I've listened to some really high-level people, Columbia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they say a lot of things, every other sentence includes the word, the word escape. Mm -hmm. okay. I would suggest that if you looked at the answers instead of the searches or in addition to the searches, you would find we don't know anything about escape. You wouldn't find it. So whoever is hearing the word and going to search is getting virtually nothing. Which, given that the high levels are saying every other word sentence, it's there. And they're 
there's nothing in the answers. It might be worth looking at. Say, say, say a little bit more in terms of the climate solutions and where we need to be investing. Or are you talking about sort of outside of individual so, choices? So we were all taught the correct definition of scale by one of the greatest scalers in the history of the world, Kobe. And we all learned it with this simple sentence. We need fill in the blank CPD beds, vaccines mm -hmm. at scale. Correct definition of scale is not worth that nothing in it. That's a little bit that we can throw in. But it's all about at the level that solves the problem. We had several million people in the world, as soon as that scaler attacked us, who knew what at scale looks like. Mm -hmm. And they could immediately step into a lighted room and begin mapping paths to at scale. Yeah. And that's how we got there so fast. Yeah. There's no one in this entire city who can show you at scale the climate change. Not hmm. a single person. So we are all in dark rooms trying to figure out paths to a destination we can't see. And no one knows where to point us. I very much appreciate the comment. And what I, I, I will say, I think that Come from, you know, organizations like Johan's at Exponential Roadmap are actually doing that, of showing us what is that roadmap to scale. Or I'm a huge fan of John Doerr's recent book, Speed and Scale, um, that is actually really trying to show us exactly what is that playbook, what are those levers. Um, but I think I'm hearing your point of how do we highlight that better? How do we do the storytelling around that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, no, I, I, I appreciate the push there. Thank you. So let me, yeah. shall I wrap up? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, well, I, actually, I was just going to come and sit next to you. So oh, please. Enjoying this. Okay, this good, good. <laughs> yes, yes. So, but, but, and let's talk more afterwards. I would love your, I would love your perspective on that. Um, so the last thing I just want to say in closing and, and kind of coming back to how Soli and Johan teed us up is there is so much opportunity here. Um, speaking of the large levers that we have, absolutely we need companies to be setting net zero targets and to be achieving them and to have the transparency to achieve them. And I will tell you, I think there is even more opportunity here in this space of what does it really look like for us to put climate action at the core of product strategy, to meet people where they are, to give them those helpful actions that they can take in their daily lives. And I've been really heartened in a lot of the rooms that I've been in this week of hearing from peers in many different sectors, from consumer goods to financial services products and others that are saying, we want to do this too. And we want to figure out how to unlock this potential so I have a bit of a call to action, which is that I would love for us to come together around this. And I do think one key piece of it, and I know we have a, a great speaker who's going to come on in a little while to talk from WBCSD, is the measurement. How do we really put strong measurement behind this work so that we understand its impact? And I shared with you some of the examples that we have where we have a really strong ability to measure things like Google Map, it's a nest. But we need a lot more work here, and I think we need to come together around this because it's going to be hard, it's going to be imperfect. But I think that presents a huge opportunity and will enable us to unlock this potential. So I'm excited to continue this conversation. Um, and, and thank you all and, and appreciate the comment as well. Thank you so much, guys. Um, if, you, if you could just stay with us for one more second, right, just to, I, one of the other reasons why I came up here is because I think there might be a few more questions oh, for you. If we have time for so, more um, let's do it. Does anyone else have, have a question for Kate? I know it's quite a big deal because we all live in Google. So um, here we go, at the back. I'm afraid we're gonna have to do the same thing with my mic. So if you come and snap, just stand next to me, that's thank fine, you. Thank, thank you. you. Well, amazing, amazing job, Kate, congratulations. Uh, we were just talking uh, here in front about uh, news and how news uh, outlets are addicted to bad news, doomism. Mm -hmm. And many people, I would say most of the people get their news through Google News. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know the work you're doing with the UN, with other organizations mm -hmm. to kind of bring up um, solutions, climate solutions. And are you working with uh, solutions journalism, for example, mm -hmm. uh, to bring up more of the solution side of things than the doomism side of things? Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Yes, and I think coming back to the point on storytelling, which is so critical. So, so you mentioned the work we're doing with the UN. Absolutely, we're working with the UN Act Now platform, which is very much related to this conversation we're having of how do we show people those 10 UN Act Now principles of those actions they can take in their daily lives that are meaningful. So that's been a great partnership. And then I mentioned YouTube. That's, I think, the place where we've really begun because... I think our YouTube creators have such a unique voice in this space. They're reaching people in ways 
um, that I that I think you know not frankly none of us can do. Um, but I absolutely take your point on on news as well. I think that's that's another opportunity space. Okay, actually take a seat because yeah. I'm going to invite um, another corporate to come up and join us, perhaps at a slightly different scale, but uh, uh, but also working on this issue of how do we engage publics to take action. So Eva, do you want to come and, come and take a seat as well? So Eva um, is the CEO of Houdini, uh, who make these wonderful um, uh, outdoor and indoor door clothing. And, and at Houdini, would you say a word about what you've been doing to engage your consumers in, in how they can take action? Yes, uh, yeah, and we're at an entirely different scale for sure. Uh, so we know our customers really, really well. We kind of live the life that our customers live, meaning that our desires and like the narratives for the world we want to create is also our customers. And then we've just gone about designing exactly that. How can we live a life that we love uh, without the negative impacts? How can we create a wardrobe that is small and does water for us rather than a huge one? One, you know, except for different sports we do and bringing heat loads of products uh, with us to New York on a week like this, but rather the opposite. Uh, and focus on what's truly valuable for us as humans mm -hmm. and for everyone as humans. And that is nature and living this beautiful life and breathing the air, like Espen said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so moving towards circular, regenerative, um, less stuff that can do more for us. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we've been working on. Okay. Thank so you. in terms of the, how we assess and understand our impact and then also need to work, it's not only then how we design a product or how we produce the products, but taking responsibility for the volumes we produce. We need to make sure that we reduce volumes. And then but taking I, responsibility of the lifestyle. How yes, can we, the lifestyle. How can we inspire and enable a lifestyle that is the one we want to live? I don't think anybody is happier for shopping like crazy. <laughs> we know that. But we still are in yeah. stuck in that system yeah. that we don't have. So I think one of the things which is really interesting about uh, particularly so, you know, what, what Google, like, of course, Google does produce hardware in, 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 in terms of the, um, the, 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 the pixels, etc., which, which we buy. But when, um, uh, when we're shopping, particularly for, for fashion, I think the, it's really interesting to think about how, out, how outdoor and nature um, can affect our behaviours when we're actually thinking about what we buy. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to um, ask, ask Ava to join us. Um, in terms of how do we, uh, sorry, yes, uh, please, please do, do, do take my microphone. In, in terms of how we, uh, how we activate uh, people, we've heard from Kate about actually in many ways these things make our lives easier. Um, one of the things which I've noticed about eco-friendly routing is that it's also a more enjoyable drive because you're not sitting in traffic. So even if it does take a moment longer, actually it's less frustrating. So it's often uh, eco-friendly lifestyle is less, less frustrating that actually buying great quality stuff that you can hold on to and um, which is associated with memories of when you walked up that mountain or when you sat by that lake and actually what you're wearing um, reminds you of that, which is why you want to hold on to it rather than disposing of it and buying something else. Um, does anyone have any questions or even any observations about how living this sustainable life can be actually better for us? Uh, yeah, I actually had a question for Google Please. again in that um, the projects you proposed are very interesting, but we know the core business of Google is advertising. And I'm really interested, we're talking about lifestyle change, we're talking about lifestyle consumption, and we've also been talking about status consumption. And I'm trying to understand how Google thinks about its core business as advertising is probably driving an incredible amount of demand. That advertising is driving an incredible amount of demand that doesn't actually serve the fundamental well-being of the consumers. That it's stimulating lots of emotional responses and potentially creating a huge excess of consumption. Yeah, and I, and I think this very much comes back to exactly this conversation that we're having. I think we need to all come together as brands around how do we shift this paradigm? How do we make the sustainable choice, the easier choice, the better choice, the most cost-effective choice? 
And that's where, as I'm sitting in rooms with other companies that, of course, also do their advertising on Google, how do we come together around that? And how do we enable them in a way that's meaningful to show what are their most sustainable products? What would that choice look like? And I think this is a challenging space, right? I think eco-labels can be really useful. And I mentioned some of the early ones we've worked with, like Energy Star, you know, highly reputable, run by the Environmental Protection Agency. But this is also a crowded and challenging space. So what are the right ways that we can signal, that we can partner with brands so that that's what they can lift up, that that's what they can put front and center so we can make people aware of what those choices look like? So that's very much where I want to take the conversation and where I think we have a lot of opportunity. Thank you, Kate. We have, uh, I'm just going to double, uh, so you already asked one question. We've got a question at the back, I'm afraid. So we're just going to go. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Martin Chilcott from Manufacture 2030. Uh, question really about how do you think we can connect hard to reach audiences with stories and with the tools and the great things that you're doing? When, when you mention YouTube to me, I'm, I'm not saying this is the case, but my concern is that we are talking to an audience through YouTube who are going to be already wanting to engage with the story. And I wonder if there are sectors of our societies which are older, richer, more consuming, who probably aren't using YouTube, who aren't engaging. How, how, how do we connect the story to all the great things that you're doing to more difficult to reach uh, sectors? I love that because usually when we talk about difficult to reach sectors, we're talking about the young or the disenfranchised. <laughs> Actually, the old and the rich <laughs> as a difficult to reach sector. That's such a great point. <laughs> yes. And, and I, I will honestly put that question back to you. What are your recommendations? Yeah. What do you think is going to happen? Actually, Martin's an expert in this. So yeah. 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 Well, we're, we are, we're, I'm working with some guys from the BBC and from yeah. uh, Entertainment World at the moment about trying to use reality TV formats. Um, where we've got, and, and you can tune the personality in the reality TV format to the hard to reach audience you're trying to reach, you're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. So it's very flexible. Mm -hmm. um, and that the types of uh, reality TV formats are sort of challenge formats where you have teams against each other mm -hmm. who have to do something more sustainable. They have to change their homes. They have to go on a holiday in a different way. They have to do various different things. And, and so those are the sort of formats we're looking at at the moment and looking to see if we can connect them up then with something that's much broader and much wider than that, that television program. But, but that's the sort of thing that we're exploring and I think it's possible. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I would love, I would love to talk with you more. So yeah, no, I think it's a great point. Thank you so much. I'm afraid, I'm sorry, sir, but we're, oh, I even wanted to jump in. I'm afraid we do have to get to our next panel. Yes. So Eva, did you, would you just take the microphone there, Eva? You have a beautiful, softly spoke voice. Yes, yeah, sorry, you didn't hear me late, earlier. So. Uh, yes, I just wanted to mention, you uh, had a slide with a 5% yes. potential of 5%. I just have one data point with me today. And, you know, in the Western world, there's an average use of a garment of 7 to 10 times, and then it's discarded. And we know that our users use our products more than a thousand times over 10 years time, several times a week for many different activities. I'm wearing Houdini today and I would go running in it. It's maybe not this one, but anyways. Uh, imagine if we can shift then volumes and lifestyle, they go together, shifting from 10 to a thousand. Imagine how much less products we would produce, how much less money we would and waste that will be reduced as well. And there's, there's so many benefits for all of us, individually, societally, and then planetary, of course. Mm -hmm. That's you, the Eva. opportunity. And actually, just to close, that's an opportunity that it, people want. Because, of course, one of the things which the Google search team shared with me was the fact that we're all searching for how to live this life. Searches for uh, uh, how, how to buy a cheap electric car, searches for um, plant-based diets, searches for solar panels on my house. These searches are on an exponential upwards curve in terms of publics across the world. And I think that's one of the things, we can ask every single survey question we want to ask. We can you know, get people in focus groups about sustainable lifestyles. But one of the most encouraging things for me is that people are actually out there already asking these questions. And Google has the data to show that this is something which the public wants to know. And the question, of course, is, 
What answer we, are we going to give to that? How are we actually able to fulfill that clear desire that people do have to live this life? And that's what we're going to be talking about on our next panel. So I want to thank Kate Grant and I want to thank Eva so much for coming up. And talking about this. I'm now going to ask Dominic to come down. Um, uh, Dominic is from uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, which I learned a long time ago that if you can't say WBCSD without hesitation <laughs> or repetition, then you don't it's really work in sustainable talk. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> WBCSD. Okay. WBCSD. Exactly. Exactly. No, no, it's, it's, it's literally a gatekeep to whether you work here is whether you do that. So Dominic and the team at WBCSD, and I've been so lucky to be part of some of this work, has been really looking at this is great. It's really encouraging that companies want to do this. Um, we've got survey data that shows that the public wants companies to help them with this. Um, but how do we measure and how do we know whether when companies are engaging us in our lifestyles, um, whether they're actually helping us to avoid emissions? Thank you very much. Can you hear me at the back all right? I, you need to use the microphone for the, the oh, video, I'm, I'm afraid. Sorry. There we go. All right. Um, so thank you very much uh, for having us here. Um, super discussion. I'm trying to sort of, you know, segue um, into another stage of this. But let's go on a journey. Uh, and it actually was brilliant, um, the stuff that you were saying there, okay, on the search. So scenario number one. Um, I'm, not me personally, but let's have a metaphor. Uh, I'm a large uh, food company. Um, and traditionally, over the years, I've uh, sourced, manufactured, transported and sold loads of meat. Hang on a minute, diets are changing, things are going on. I'm now moving into plant-based diets or um, new kinds of protein. You can see that happening in the marketplace right now. And so things are going on both within my supply chain and for my customers, I'm sort of shifting. What we call the scope three emission, for those of you who kind of follow these things terribly closely, is everything outside of the company's own uh, greenhouse gas emissions that they have in their plant and the energy that they use, but everything else all the way along that value chain. So perhaps the uh, impact on the forest of growing that beef, um, all of the uh, implications of being a cow over the number of years, you've probably read loads of reports about how heavy that is in greenhouse gas emissions, and then to the other end. But if I'm shifting to a plant-based approach, I'm losing a lot of that stuff in my scope three emissions. So my scope three emissions are going down. So that's quite good. I'm shifting towards that net zero uh, target. But the other rather interesting thing is that lots of customers are buying plant-based food. Um, and so their emissions in their households and their lifestyles is also going down. But I, I don't catch that um, in my inventory of my greenhouse gas emissions. I'm literally, because how we've designed it so far, um, the things that I do in my factory, the energy that I use, and the impact I have across my value chain. But the fact that I am producing more and more plant-based diets, and I'm having a contribution to society for people to have more choices to buy that stuff. But that doesn't, isn't something that fits into that inventory at the moment. It's the same, if I may, um, to sort of jump to a different kind of analogy. The fact that there is a, a service available globally to um, search for all of the products and services or foods or lifestyle choices that will allow me as a person to have a much more low emission lifestyle is a huge service to society. It didn't exist and now it exists, but it's not something that Google can put in their inventory when they're looking at greenhouse gas emission reduction. And you're kind of like, huh. Maybe it's a really, really big contribution to solving the problem. But when we're kind of sitting here in these, in these discussions and we're saying, net zero by 2030, you'll get on target, it doesn't include that bit. So it's sort of missing out the whole innovation space, which we're, we're kind of asking business and finance and investors to get really smart about kind of pushing um, the change that we need. But we're not actually measuring that bit. Can also work in a different way. So here's another conundrum. Um, I'm not um, a big meat producing company going into plant protein, nor am I um, a large tech company. Um, I'll be an energy uh, company. And I think, actually, do you know what? Um, rather than kind of making oil-fired boilers, I'm going to make uh, photovoltaic solar, because there's loads of people want to buy it. Um, and I've started, and it's going really well. Um, and loads of people are buying my um, solar um, plates. But because it's going really well, I'm growing as a company. So I'm actually 
creating more emissions, even I'm trying really hard per unit to keep them low, but I'm growing. So kind of net, I'm having more of an impact on my emissions, but I'm selling loads and loads and loads of clean solar panels. So people's emissions in their houses, as was mentioned earlier, is going down. But I don't catch that benefit because I'm only able to account for what I am producing, either the energy that I use, the factory that I have, or when it goes out the door. I can't, I haven't got the societal gain of all those people now using my product and changing their energy from oil to solar. So in that example, it's sort of the reverse. I'm doing a bigger contribution to society with my solar panels, but I'm kind of caught because my emissions are actually going up because my business is, is growing. I'm doing all that I can, but they're still going up. So this piece um, at the end of the jigsaw um, is starting to take um, quite a lot of interest among people. And the term that's emerged is called avoided emissions. And you can absolutely see um, probably half of you are thinking, oh, that's quite interesting. And another half thinking, oh, yeah, I can see what's going on here. <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's the conundrum. Because if we want to shift lots of business investors to go down this path, it's all about kind of the incentive. It's all about showing the societal gain. Um, and it's all, if you're in the kind of business investment community, about kind of finding methodologies and frameworks and KPIs um, and incentives and rewards to do it. And for society and decision makers, it's all about trusting the information. Mm -hmm. So we're at a stage where, even though we have really good methodological frameworks for what we call scope one and what we call scope two, um, and we're building really, really good frameworks for scope three, and there's something called the greenhouse gas protocol, which does all of that work, and you can kind of download it and make it work in your organization and such. Pretty good. And we have science-based targets to be able then to say, well, I know now what I am measuring, and here's my target, which I want to get to by 2030 and towards 2050. Um, and we have disclosure frameworks like the CDP and others, so I can then sort of post what I'm doing, and other people can look at it, and investors can make a judgment, and society can make a judgment. What we do not have is that other bit that I was just talking about. Um, and that doesn't exist in the inventory. You can't kind of put that in that protocol that was just there because it's actually about innovation and a societal contribution. It's almost like uh, an, an innovation protocol that's required to help kind of provide more choices, more opportunity uh, to society. But if you capture that, it starts to change the game a little bit for some of the most progressive, most exciting companies. It could be big, could be small, but that contribution to that um, journey is huge. And that is the methodology that is required. Um, and that is the methodology that we're working on at WBCSD with about 40 um, companies and stakeholders and experts to make sure, like we built the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, that it's not a kind of a greenwash exercise. It's true. And it doesn't allow people to pretend that what they're doing is that when it's not. Um, but there are lots of companies and enterprises who are doing an awful lot in that space, which can add a new huge contribution. And then if you think about it, if you do have that inventory, um, which starts to look at the innovation side and the opportunities and, and products and services and innovations to society um, in those avoided emission spaces. As an investor, well, that's a pretty interesting company to be in. Now I've got metric to know I want to put my money in there. It's not just about kind of keeping their own house in order. It's about the opportunity and growth and space that they are providing. It's also very true for the company itself to think, hmm, if there's a methodology and a metric and investors quite like that, this will help me target key markets or key segments to really push my new product range because I can see how I will get um, that measurement of the contribution that I am making. So um, quarter four of this year, there'll be um, a first cut at this, which will be an assessment methodology for avoided emissions. So if you are on or around COP, um, you know, you'll see the exciting debate where some people will be very enthusiastic and some people will be picking holes with it, but that's fine. That's part of these processes that we go through. Um, and then into 2023, it will become quite a thing, I think. Um, we are getting a lot of interest in this from um, markets in Asia. At Japan, who have the G7, and I'll close here next year. Um, there's a lot of Japanese companies who they're going, they have a net zero target in Japan. So they're having to do their scope one, scope two, scope three. But they feel they have an enormous amount of technology in things like air conditioners or, or solar, you know, that they can sell to the world much more so than other markets. Mm -hmm. um, and for Japan, as a, um, 
their NDC, for example, their nationally determined contribution. And for the companies in Japan, this is a, something that they're very excited about, but they need the methodology to show that it's not just sort of you know, making it up is actually a really true contribution. Right. So that's the avoided method um, emissions space. Um, and there's a methodology on its way. And if you're interested to engage, um, then please do. And thank you very much, uh, Kate and others, for kind of stimulating the conversation. And we're starting to kind of grow our maturity about how we can measure and deliver on the whole spectrum that we need to um, have these sort of solutions for uh, consumers. I hope that's a sort of sketch of, of what the space is. Thank you. Great sketch. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Questions. I'm actually going to ask you to take a seat and then we're going to come back and do a panel in a moment. But, to, but to, yeah, yeah, go away and then come back. It's not a yellow card. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't go too far. Yeah, yeah, stay where I can see you. Um, uh, because uh, this avoided emissions uh, framework work is so important to actually give some rigor and some boundaries to what everybody's talking about in terms of enabling this lifestyle and behavior change. Now, uh, Dominic gave some examples there. Um, so uh, providing a solar panel is a very obvious way in which you're enabling a behavior change. But other ways in which you might enable a behavior change are a little bit more perhaps uh, uh, unclear in terms of how would you actually know whether you were behind, but changing the behavior. Because buying a panel or not buying a panel is one thing. Um, uh, uh, turning down a shower to, to a colder or turn or putting your washing on 30 rather than 50. That can be a little bit more difficult to know whether you've done it and much, much more difficult to encourage because those one-off big purchases of a car or a solar panel, we use our executive processing for. We sit down and we make decisions. But the vast majority of what we do every day that has an impact on climate change are actually our daily behaviors, our daily consumption behaviors, which perhaps we're not using our executive function for so much. We're actually using some of our habits, our heuristics, perhaps slightly more our heart than our head. And I'm so pleased to have Andrew Cooper here um, and also Wilder from B Works, who is a partner of Futera, to come and talk to us a little bit about, well, how do, can we actually change some of those behaviours, which then we're going to be talking about with Dominic about them measuring. So, please, Angela. Thanks, Sally. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about you know, how do we create action? How do we create solutions? And at BE Works, we, we take a slightly different perspective. You know, we come at it from a behavioural science perspective. And so, you know, as Sally's mentioned, you know, when we're thinking about demand side carbon mitigation, we're talking about people. And people come with biases, psychological biases and other sorts of things that we need to take into consideration. And so how can we leverage what we know about human behavior and how people make decisions to actually help them avoid these lifestyle emissions? And so to begin to start even addressing this challenge, you know, the first thing that we really need to ask ourselves are, you know, what sort of actions should we actually be encouraging people to take? You know, what are the behaviors that businesses and, and governments should be trying to help their citizens to change? Seems like a fairly straightforward question. What, what action do people take? And in fact, as, you know, Solly's already mentioned, you know, the IPCC has identified over 60 what they call mitigation behaviors. Seems like, you know, they're laying out a, an action plan. Companies can just select their behavior of interest, build a behavior change campaign to drive that behavior. Perfect. But, you know, we as, you know, when we sat down and looked at this list, you know, from a kind of behavioral science perspective, we were noticing they're actually not behaviors. You know, we're thinking about less packaging, food waste reduction, fuel efficient driving. That's the outcome. And what's missing is, well, what are the actual actions that need to be taken to achieve that outcome? So that, that missing puzzle piece is critical because how do you start to build a solution to drive a particular outcome if you don't actually know what the behavior is that you're trying to enable people to do? And really, behavior change initiatives in general, you know, they're only gonna be successful if you're providing people with specific and actionable behaviors that they can act on. And so what I'm showing you here is just 10 of what we're calling now mitigation outcomes that the IPCC identified. And what you'll see here is that for each outcome, 
they're a product of many different potential antecedent behaviors. Let's just take food waste, for example. You know, you think about talking about Google searches. If people say, you know, how do I reduce my food waste? And if I put that into the search, you might get seven, eight, ten different possible actions you could be taking because it could be make better meal plans. It could be how you store your food. How do you shop? How do you cook your food? And so then the question becomes, where do I start? Like, how do I even begin to build a solution to drive people towards the right behavior if I don't know which behavior is actually going to have the kind of impact that we need? And so that is sort of, there's the gap between, you know, where the IPCC has left us in terms of these fantastic recommendations of what's going to have the kind of carbon impact that we need. But what we first need to do is look at a systematic way of determining which specific mitigation behaviors will actually lead to the outcomes we're interested in before we can begin to start building solutions and, and leveraging all these great behavior change tools to drive those kinds of uh, outcomes. And so, you know, in partnership with Futera, you know, what BeeWorks has done is, is sort of taken a look at how can we build a roadmap to making those IPCC recommendations a reality. And so I'll kind of walk you through each of these different steps. But the first step being, we have to identify what are those keystone behaviors. And I'll talk a bit more about what that means. Because that will allow us to assess what are the practical as well as psychological barriers to actioning on that. And then once we know what those barriers are for that particular behavior, we can start developing solutions specifically around overcoming those barriers. And so step one, which seems very, very straightforward, but is, is no small feat to actually identify what are keystone behaviors. And so let's, you know, we talked a little bit about Google Maps. Let's, ta let's talk about fuel efficient driving as an outcome. And so, you can see here, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, there's a number of different behaviors that you could take to achieve fuel efficient driving. Everything from taking the shortest route, maybe not speeding, using eco mode on your car. And so how do you start to figure out, well, which behavior should I be driving people towards? And one method is defining keystone behaviors. So these are, are single concrete actions that can then have an impact and affect multi potentially multiple different antecedent behaviors. And so one example is potentially, in this case, using GPS navigation. Thank you, Google, for providing that. Because that will cover off things like taking the shortest route, avoiding driving at busy times of day. And so you're able to be more efficient and targeted in terms of what you're able to cover off. And that then forms the cornerstone of a behavior change campaign. Once you've identified this is the action that will most likely have the most potential impact. We can then go into step two, which is, okay, well, what are the barriers to that specific action? And really, when we're assessing, you know, what kinds of keystone behaviors we should focus on, one part of that process is thinking through, well, what are the practical barriers to that? And ideally, you're selecting a keystone behavior where those practical barriers are as minimal as possible. We can ask ourselves questions like, you know, is that behavior under a person's control or not? You know, is, does it already exist? Is that option available? In the case of GPS navigation, it's available, so that's fantastic. Is there an economic impact? Are they gonna have to pay for this? Are they even aware that this option exists? And so ideally, we're, we're selecting a keystone behavior that you know, these, the answers to these questions are, are positive. Because then that takes us to, even if we've got a fairly minimal set of practical barriers, you know, as, I, as I've been talking about, we're dealing with people. And that necessarily comes with a host of different psychological barriers. And thankfully, you know, Pear has really beautifully wrapped up a lot of what those barriers are, so I won't go through all of them in detail. But what's critical here is for that given keystone behavior, in the, you know, thinking about GPS navigation, for instance, we have to then assess the existence and severity of the psychological barriers that are unique to that behavior. You know, and there are a number of different ones that, are, that crop up frequently. You know, we talk about being loss averse. You know, are we asking people to give something up? Or we talk about being present biased. You know, we're strongly, uh, we strongly prioritize the kind of gains that we can get right now over something that's happening in the future. So is the behavior that we're asking them to do, is that gonna give them any immediate benefits? Like 
maybe having a pleasanter drive uh, or things like that? And can we highlight that for, for individuals? And so what will be critical is taking a, taking a stock of what the psychological barriers are because then that you can create the appropriate solutions that address those barriers. Ooh, it jumped ahead. Here we go. And so, you know, and thankfully the IPCC, you know, they've laid out a number of, you know, well-validated, probably classic behavioral uh, science tactics, things like defaults, um, communicating norms, feedback, reminders, all excellent tactics. But like any toolbox, you're not necessarily just gonna reach your hand in grab for a tool and sort of off you go. You want to try and select the appropriate tool that will be most effective for the behavior that you're interested in driving. And so that's why it's so essential to first take that step back and go, well, what, what's the psychology at play for this behavior? Because then I can select and, and be more informed about which tools I'm gonna select to overcome those barriers. So if we, we take this GPS navigation again, as an example, we might you know, diagnose that for this particular behavior, maybe there's a lack of trust in technology, or maybe there's a feeling of low self-efficacy on the part of users. And so then that allows us to kind of hone in on well, what's the appropriate behavioral science tool to address that barrier. So in the case of lack of trust, maybe it's about communicating a social norm to help, over, to help build trust. Oh, everyone's, everyone's using it, this is very common or to build people's self-efficacy. Maybe it's about framing the, the navigation less as, a, as a, a driving aid that maybe feels like a crutch, more of an innovative tool. You, know, it's, you, know, you can think about what's the kind of creatively different ways you can instantiate behavioral tactics that address the psychological barriers that you've identified. And so just to, to sum up, you know, from our perspective, the IPCC recommendations are, are fantastic. They, they're, they're goalposts. You know, they give us the destination that we're interested in. And what's going to be really important to think about for you know, everyone in this room and, and those who are interested in building solutions and, and taking action is, what is the necessary roadmap to get to that destination? And it's going to really, because we're dealing with people, it's going to fundamentally come down to understanding why people make decisions, the decisions that they make, and how that affects uh, their behavior. going to ask Wada from, um, uh, from BE Works as well to come up and join us. And Dominic, I'm going to ask you to come back all the way back down. So um, uh, this for me has just been so, uh, so interesting to think about uh, how do we actually measure it and make sure that companies are doing this right? And also how do we do it? And I think that this point around uh, the IPCC 61 behaviours are not behaviours at all. They're actually uh, outcomes that we then need to do this very careful behavioral um, uh, piece. I, I, I've got a question over here at the back. Um, yep. Thank you. And then- I'm, I'm absolutely, Sol, today has been absolutely fabulous, just to say that to you. So give her a hand. Of, <laughs> absolutely amazing. I, I want to tie a couple of threads together and ask you a question uh, about it. And, and, and the thread is this, that you know, Per was talking earlier about socializing, wasn't he, at the beginning, yeah. the power of socializing. We've now got outcomes we've identified that have impact. We have Kate talking about your, your navigation tools and actually being able to identify how many cars you're taking up the road. Can we connect, not just in this room, the behavior chains at scale with people to outcomes? So could we, for instance, um, you know, I'm just gonna go back to this, uh, this reality TV concept, but can we get the stars of the reality TV concept and taking up some of these actions as part of what they've got to do, and then as the interactivity of the program is the public, the viewers, commit publicly to the action that the star has taken, they can see how many of the audience, how big the take-up has been, and then can we quantify the impact? So can we tell them Look, if we all do this and we commit, like you're saying, it's not just the star that travels more eco-friendly to the sun, but actually these are the amount of cars, you know, this, by the end of this program, how many hundreds of thousands of cars have taken off the road? Does that, does that change the dynamic of engagement, positivity, feedback? I mean, it just feels like it's just yeah. 
per story uh, encapsulated, doesn't it? Well, let's let's put this to both both um, uh, uh, Dominic and the Beanie Works team. So from a behavioural perspective, um, does that sound like a good idea? And I hate to put you on the spot, no, but can you no. immediately think about any any barriers or ways to make that even more effective as an yeah, idea? Yeah. And I think it's great. But I'm going to come first to Dominic and go, one of the... Th- one of the biggest challenges I think is going to be with the avoided emissions concept, which I love and I want to help promote, is going to be this area between products and services or measurable changes such as Google's making and then things which are more communicative or storytelling. Um, so where for you does the line go in terms of something which would count as an avoided emission? Does, 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 does you know, if, if we were able to measure the behaviours, because of course measuring the, 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 the commitments would yeah. be the same thing, but if we were able to measure the, uh, would that mean that the game show would be able to claim an avoided emission? Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I, I'm, I'm warming you up for, for part. Okay, yeah. so there's, there's a couple, there's a, there's a, there's a couple of things. It's, it's, first of all, it's a super interesting space. We're now into this, so a big shift scale thing that was, was mentioned yeah. earlier. Um, and we're kind of stretching our feeling of what an accounting framework can do. We were looking at kind of you know, large scale behaviors. So there's a couple of things. One, um, certainly within kind of the company perspective and within investors and all of the rules and regs, there's a sort of area where you can kind of nail that avoided emissions bit. And I made, gave a couple of examples. To the point that you made, um, I so. Um, that is a hugely interesting space um, where you know a, a Google and others, I think, can take a lot of opportunity. In I mean, who doesn't have a um, an Android or a, you know a smartphone on them right now? Probably everybody has one. It's an environmental audience, so sometimes you do get that. <laughs> no, right, that's why. That's why. Yeah, that's why. Like, it will not but, but the point <laughs> is, is rather than having kind of enterprise accounting, you could have individual accounting and all of the different kind of incentives and pings and things that would go with that right and that's a lot of people and it's not just people in new york or people in london there's a lot of people in jakarta most have at least 3g access mm-hmm. and it's not just people in an urban area it's a farmer mm-hmm. you know and and the farmer in congress she might have a hectare of land and she has choices to make mm-hmm. about avoided emissions or about growing a different kind of crop and if you can actually disintermediate between all of those middle pieces and have choices and opportunity and credit go straight through there, you unlock it. Um, But we're not there yet for all kinds of reasons, but we could be. So I think that's the scaling device for the individual. Um, The piece of the methodology, if you like, for the avoided emissions is really that kind of corporate and financial investor Mm -hmm. level. So it's a sort of idea, I suppose, but I think it's coming. I mean, it's interesting that you talk about kind of an, an at an individual level sort of tracking to sort of speak to your point about kind of making it social and that sort of feedback loop that's there. You know, there's been a lot of research on the, the power, of course, of, of social norms, you know, at an aggregate level. And I think there, there are dangers potentially to, to providing feedback, particularly at an individual level, for, because for a lot of these behaviors, you know, I, I've worked a lot in food waste, you know, the amount that an individual saves on a daily level is seemingly negligible. And so if you're sharing that back, it can be potentially demotivating being like, oh, it's only like 20 grand. You know, like it, you don't feel like you're making the kind of impact that you want. And so it, it, you sort of have to be careful about what kinds of, of feedback that you're providing. So I think, you know, maybe when you're tracking at an individual level, but you're feeding back at an aggregate level of yeah. saying, yeah. you are part of, look, yeah. your contribution is this yeah. much. Because I think a lot of people want to say, oh, how much am I doing? But I think that can be a tricky space and, and yeah. potentially dangerous. I'm just going to come to Ward Weekly because mm-hmm. Ward and I have discussed this quite a lot um, because uh, there is the danger in this whole conversation of like unleashing a new greenwash wave mm-hmm. of going, great, the IPCC has given us these behaviours. Every ad firm is, is girding itself up to say, we do behaviour change. Look at this wonderful ad- advert we've made encouraging you to recycle mm-hmm. your cups. Um, but but what and I have been talking about, if you can't count the carbon, it doesn't count. Like if you actually can't count the behaviours and therefore the carbon. Um, and so for, for, from a behavioural, um, uh, it, like how hard is it to actually measure whether, beha- whether anyone's actually done the behaviour? 
Well, I think that's a great question. We, yeah. it, I think it probably depends on what behavior we're trying to measure, but yeah. I love that technology is a part of that now because yeah. Google's power to even understand whether people go to a destination. Do they look up a solution to do something and then do they actually follow through by taking a different mode of transportation, for example. Mm -hmm. You can tell us whether people drove and took the eco-friendly route or did they actually switch over to public transit or walk or bike because you're providing all of those options. So I think it's getting easier and easier to actually measure those things and bring it all together. Um, and this is really where we're excited to be partnering with Futera and using technologies such as Google to sort of create that whole chain of mm -hmm. these are the strategies that we can use from a behavior change perspective. We've sort of validated that these are going to be the ones that matter from a carbon reduction perspective. And now let's actually use technology to measure this shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess if you're able to prove that what you did caused the behavior change, the so yeah. causality being a really big part of that, and then be able to count the carbon, it would count as an avoided emission. If you could, if you could show the the through line. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, please, please. please. And that, and so the, the aggregate bit is, is, is the key. So yeah. I've got like a dog walking app, you know. Not, yeah. But what's brilliant is they like, um, <clears throat> put your dog in um, and all around the world, people have got that dog and you suddenly get quite competitive. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, and so that you, it's sort of like, oh, look, I want to be in like the top quintile of like yeah. taking this to the poor dogs. To the yeah, so just dragging uh, it. But you, you're really motivated. It's, it's yeah. that, you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. It's that sort of aggregation bit. Yeah. So it might be like 20 grams, but then you can see that you're part of a community. Absolutely. Which is actually doing an awful lot. And for that, that sense of what can I do, because yeah. it seems such a big structural, mm -hmm. massive problem. Yeah. Everyone's very technical and talks about things that I understand. Something like that can really work, whether Absolutely. it's that little bit of food waste or whether it's the choice of transport. Yeah. Today, I've been part of two billion people who chose to yeah. do this, and mm -hmm. it's told me that I've contributed to saving those, yeah. whatever, loads of times. Mm -hmm. I yeah. feel good about that. I've yeah. done my bit, and I want to do more. I want to be in the top, you know, what's yeah. yeah. like, Dad, did you do it? Oh, I didn't do it today. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that thing. Absolutely. I think that's, that's this huge opportunity, but that mm -hmm. isn't technically yet what that avoided emissions method, it could be. Yeah. But at the moment, yeah. it's very enterprise focused yes. because yeah. we, to the point that was made earlier, we do not want this to be a get out of jail card. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Behavioral offsetting. So, so we, we can be very excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, very excited about the opportunity space, but we have to get the rules of the game right. Right. With no wiggle room for big companies to do, you know, yeah. different things. So that's like what that methodology is focused on. Yeah. But absolutely, the opportunity space is huge. So yeah. Yeah. The other one quick point that I want to make is that social comparisons, they're great, they're wonderful, they get used a lot. But one thing that we've seen work quite well is comparisons to ourselves. So when we are extremely motivated to create change, coming out of an event like this, and you know, you, you've got the show and people pledge and they're following through, is to not forget that you did this once. So this is where you were today and you made the right actions. And if people start to slip, it's important to remind them that you were capable of doing this. And I think testing out social proof versus individual growth and reminding them if they're slipping or where they could be to set a new goal is, is, is an important well, strategy. Well, Guys, pair, exactly, oh, I'm oh, running, so you're running fast. So I'm going to take two very quick questions, but they must be questions um, <laughs> only. So quick, quick, one sentence question, and then I'll go to, to you and then we'll wrap up. Well, I feel like I'm at the Edinburgh Fringe and with a group of people who took too small a room. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great stuff. Um, you have to stop and ask the questions. What questions did the people who set the objective and the people who set the measurements not know to ask? And therefore, they set, the wrong, they set an objective that was limited, and they defined measurements that were limited. If you don't ask those questions, you will miss scale. Scale will not happen. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. I mean, I'd love to hear, can you take your corporate data gathering and aggregate it into what are the most popular strategies that are being selected by the companies? What are the strategies that they considered that weren't selected? Mm -hmm. What are the strategies they didn't consider that are better than either of the first two groups? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of data gathering that gets us to scale. Definitely. Yes. Thank you. And we're going to take one, one very quick question as well, just before we go to. Thank you, Evelina. 
partner from Systemic. Uh, I come from the industrial decarbonization world, so completely the other spectrum. I would say I actually found this the best session that I've seen so far, right? And I've, I've been everywhere throughout the city. Yes. So thank you so much. <laughs> No, 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 no. Okay, elaborate on that. I told you you could only ask a question, but <laughs> okay. I mean, I can I'll comment. That I'm, go I'm gonna give you one more, which is, it's also the session that gave me most hope that we might actually get there. And so I wanted to leave you with a quick thought, is I think the, ex the examples were really excellent. They also go a little bit more into, right, what are the incremental changes that we're seeing versus I think what we en in the end need is a systems change towards 2030, right? So how do you get to that 50% reduction, which means for every single individual, also here in this room, but also outside of the room, it's a 50% reduction where yeah. both the incremental changes will help, but also the bigger changes. And I think that's exactly, and I think that was the gentleman in the beginning, yeah. right, is how do we get, right, also with all of the examples that you give, all the way down to that 50%. Massive. Brilliant, thank you. So, in fact, in both of those questions were about scale. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, uh, you, <laughs> I'm so sorry, you've literally just started this work and about, and about to launch it. How do you scale it? <laughs> okay. So, um, one of the earlier speakers uh, quoted um, uh, the former European Commissioner, Jean-Claude Juncker, which, um, for a policymaker, Everyone's quite smart, right? But, and he, and the, the quote was, we know what to do, but we don't know to, how to get re-elected once we've done it. Yeah. So the scale problem mm -hmm. is not necessarily a technical solution. It's the sort of political regulatory space to allow everything to take off. Yeah. So, and that's a confidence thing. Um, and that's why the tipping point methodology is used by the champions. So about 15, 20% of the market, if you get in a certain stage, then that's gonna tip the rest. And at that stage, the regulation will go, okay, let's have electric cars. It will yeah. not happen from scratch unless it's no. a completely mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, bold administration which then disappears Definitely. in four years. Yeah. So the scale thing is actually this dance between those actors, which you know, I'm sure, because you study this all the time. So um, for something like avoided emissions, the worst thing one can do is black box it and do a whole kind of technical study and go Doo -doo, and hope somebody's yeah. going to do it. It's not, that's not going to work. So the scale starts right at the beginning with conversations like this mm -hmm. um, and with others about if this were to be true as a kind of innovation um, inventory accounting, how would you, um, Madam or Sir, from the regulatory side, start to take this into account? So in the US, you know, it's, if we're looking at this International Sustainability Standards Board or the SEC, does this scare the socks off you or is this something that we can talk about? And you start that now and you don't kind of finish the report and then try to do it. That's the scaling device because mm -hmm. you can start to impute this into a new kind of accounting standard, um, but anything new, uh-oh, you know, is, is it my idea? No. Well, then I don't, I'm not interested. So you have to kind of, kind of work that piece to get that scale. I'm actually thinking you might need to ask the behavioural economists how to sell it into the policymakers in terms of behaviour change. Yeah. So scale. What you spoke through there was a fantastic um, uh, uh, route to taking those uh, outcomes. Um, but we need, according to the IPCC, we need those outcomes to happen at scale mm -hmm. if we're going to save this 5% of demand side carbon. Yeah. So. Um, is it lots of incremental leads to scale or is there a faster route to scale? That's a big question. I think, I think it's, it comes from, it has to come from partnerships in some way. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about that, that circle of you know, structural change as well as people change and to, to sort of inspire the people change, I think there needs to be sort of a um, motivation or encouragement or nudge, you know, whatever from, you know, corporations, from governments. To, to, to benefit themselves. I think a lot of this work, you know, we've spent a lot of time kind of bash people over the head, like this is a good thing to do, you should do it. But I think it's about making it personally relevant to them, not necessarily just about saving the environment, but how is this gonna, because we're so present biased, it has to be, how is this gonna help me now? You know, is this GPS navigation is gonna get me there either faster or make my life easier? Or if you're trying to save food waste, is this not about saving the environment, it's about hey, I'm gonna actually be able to use up the food that I have and not spend money that, or waste money that I don't, uh, can't afford to waste. And so making things or connecting to people, and again, it comes down to storytelling yeah. about so how is this gonna be helpful for me right now such that I'm willing to take it on and, and show to politicians and, and sort of regulations that like, I want to do this and I'm ready to take it. And so then they're primed to be willing to do it at scale. Thank you so very much. We're actually five minutes over time and I can feel people bursting to actually say more. <laughs> but um, uh, one of the things which I love about this whole conversation is this morning we were discussing social tipping points. 
And of course, whenever we talk about tipping points, we're talking about the massive, negative, terrifying tipping points of losing uh, Greenland ice sheet, etc. But I think what we're talking about here is what could be a really fast social tipping point towards that towards that five percent. Um, and I want to thank everybody for being here and being part of this conversation. I think we are right at the beginning of something that could be super exciting. And I'll just leave you with the thought that Futera has surveyed here in the US and across Europe, asking people, um, do they want to take more sustainable behaviours? The answer is a resounding yes. Um, do they think those behaviours would add to their quality of life or distract from their quality of life? 70% of people said that they would. And when we ask people who do they want to help them live a more sustainable life, do they want governments, do they want community leaders? Actually, 80% of people want brands to help them live a more, more sustainable life because those are, the, those are the people who they interact with every single day in their house. I can't tell you how many times I use Google every day. I can't tell you how many times I use the brands that I work with every day. So we've got this massive advantage in this whole piece of work which is we're going with the flow. As, as a societies, we want to change our behaviours. So now we just need to get out there and do it and measure it appropriately. Thank you so, so, so very much. <laughs>